So well done, you're all in the right place at the right time. Just to note, you may have seen a message just then that this meeting's being recorded. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the first event in this online seminar series. I remind people that are just joining to keep their microphones muted and reiterating that this meeting will be recorded and made available on the web page wdpi.net um, after, after the, um, this event is completed over the coming weeks. I'm Daniel Griffiths, it's a researcher from Monash University in Australia who will be co coordinating this webinar today. I'll start with an acknowledgement of country. Uh, in the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and the connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to the elders past, present, and to extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples today. This webinar will begin with a brief introduction to the context of this new webinar series that I'll give, uh, taking less than 10 minutes. Then we'll hear a 30 minute presentation from today's speaker, Professor Alex Colley. And then we've allocated around 20 minutes for a question and answer session after the completion of Alex's presentation. Please feel free to use the chat function during the presentation and we'll try to get through as many of your questions uh, as you can after the presentation is completed. So these webinars are a new initiative and they're organized by the uh, ICO Scientific Committee on Work Disability Prevention and Integration. For those unfamiliar with ICO, that stands for the International Commission on Occupational Health. It's an international non-governmental professional society whose aims are to foster the scientific progress, knowledge, and development of occupational health and safety in all its aspects. It was founded in 1906 in Milan as the Permanent Commission on Occupational Health. Today, ICO is the world's leading international scientific society in the field of occupational health, with a membership of 2,000 professionals from 105 countries. A hundred years after that foundation, uh, the Scientific Committee on Work Disability Prevention and Integration was established in 2006. The primary function of this scientific committee has been to host and organize the biennial international conference focusing on scientific study and practice of work disability prevention. The launch of this, this webinar series today provides an opportunity for this international research community to come together more frequently. If you'd like to learn more about this subcommittee, I'd encourage you to visit their webpage wdpi.net to find out more and sign up to their newsletter. Today, we're fortunate enough to have Professor Alex Colley joining us from the Healthy Working Lives Research Group at Monash University. Alex is an applied public health and social policy researcher with a focus on work disability, workers' compensation, injury recovery, and rehabilitation. He leads a number of large multidisciplinary and multi-institutional research projects focused on improving worker health, supporting return to work, and preventing work disability, as well as leading a very talented research team in the Healthy Working Lives Research Group at Monash. Alex holds an Australian Research Council Future Fellowship and is the current president of the Scientific Committee on Work Disability Prevention and Integration for ICO. A reminder, there'll be a question and answer session at the end of the talk, but that you can submit questions via the chat function. Without further ado, you can come to hear Alex speak. So over to you, Alex, and share slides, please. Thank you, Daniel. Um, and it's lovely to see so many people online from all over the world. Um, some very familiar names uh, and faces. Hi, everyone. It's been a long time. Um, since I've seen some of you um, and some new people as well, which is fantastic. And as, as Daniel mentioned, you know, this is the first in a sort of hope, what we will hope will become a series of these online webinars to try to have an opportunity to share the work that we are doing around the world in work disability prevention. And we thought we would kick it off by sharing some of the research that we at Monash University in Melbourne have been focusing on. Um, Daniel, who you just met, has been a big part of the project I'm about to present. So kudos to you, Daniel, and thanks for hosting today. 
and for organizing the event and uh, all the operational and background things. And also a shout out to Tessa and Bill Shaw and Lene as well, I can see, and probably a few other people who are involved in the one of the sort of subcommittees in the Scientific Committee for Work Disability Prevention and Integration. Thanks for all your efforts in helping coordinate this and the other things that the Scientific Committee does. Now I'm going to attempt to share my screen and um, start the presentation. And please let me know if anything goes wrong here. Can you see the full screen there? Yep, fantastic, thank you. Um, I'd also like to begin by just acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land from which I am joining you today, which is the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, one of the many indigenous uh, language and clan groups we have in Australia, and pay my respect to the elders past, present and emerging, and also uh, my respect to the indigenous people of the land from which you are all joining us as well. Um, so today I'm going to, it's sort of a, it's a, it's a presentation in a couple of parts. What I'm going to try to do is give people who aren't very familiar with the Australian workers' compensation and social security system sort of a, a rapid fire summary of how it works in Australia, um, which will be challenging because it's relatively complex. Um, and then once, hopefully once I've set that context, I want to talk about an opportunity that we had as a research team to, to look closely at what happens when people's workers' compensation benefits cease. And what we mean by that is, where do people get income support from and where do they receive healthcare uh, from once their period of time in the workers' compensation system comes to an end? Um, there, this is a study that we started about five years ago, way back before anyone had heard the term COVID. Um, and it's really only now, five years later, that we're in a position to be able to wrap together all of the findings of this pretty long and quite intense research project, which has been quite complex. And hopefully today, really what I'm going to try to do is give you an overview of the main findings. Um, it's a huge amount of data we've generated in this project, and I'll really just be skimming across the surface and hopefully discussing the most important things. Um, many people have been involved, those listed on the screen here. Daniel, as I mentioned, has been a big part of this project. Also want to um, particularly mention Michael Di Donato, who has led some of the analysis that I'm going to show you today, and other colleagues from around Australia and, and Canada. Uh, if you want to get hold of me, we'll make these slides available as well after the presentation, as well as the, the video recording, but my email address is there. And the website for our, our research group is also at the bottom of this slide. Uh, there's a few organisations I should mention as well and acknowledge. So this study was funded by the Workers' Compensation Regulator in the state of New South Wales, uh, which is called the State Insurance Regulatory Authority. Um, so thank you for the funding and for providing data and for being willing to, as you will see, um, um, have a sort of independent, rigorous evaluation of a large policy change that that state government introduced um, a number of years ago now. And this is a data linkage project. And in Australia, at least, such projects aren't um, really feasible without the active involvement of lots of organisations. And the ones that we have had um, support from through this study are listed on this slide. Um, they are various Australian government and New South Wales government agencies who have either provided data or been involved in our data linkage process. So thank you to those agencies as well. Um, there's a lot of public information already on this project. The study protocol was published a couple of years ago. Uh, and on our open access website at Monash University, we have three quite detailed reports, which go into a lot more detail than I'll be able to cover today on the findings and the methods for this project. So if you are interested, here are the links to those. And we're in the process of publishing a lot of this work in the peer-reviewed literature as well. So hopefully over the next year or two, you'll see it emerging in the journals that we all read. Okay, go into the fun stuff. Um, so Australia is a sort of a strange place, unlike many other 
places in the world when it comes to the way in which we provide income support for people who are experiencing work disability. We actually have many different sources of income support for people with work disability, but the two main ones, and the ones really the focus of this study, uh, are workers' compensation and social security. And they're organised um, very differently. Um, our workers' compensation systems operate at a, a state and territory level. So for, for each of the state and territories in Australia, we have a, a workers' compensation scheme, and then our national government also um, confusingly operates three different systems as well. So we have 11 main workers' compensation systems in the country. They're all slightly different. Um, combined, they provide a workers' compensation insurance coverage for over 90% of the labour force in the country, which is around about 13 million people. Eligibility for those schemes is based on being employed, and so sole traders aren't covered uh, by these schemes because they're not in, uh, employees employed by a, an organisation, and also demonstrating that the injury or the disease for which you're making a claim is work-related. Uh, these schemes are funded by premiums paid by employers, and the main benefits, which is very relevant for tonight's conversation or today's conversation, uh, what we'll call wage replacement or income support for the period of time that a person cannot work and payments for healthcare or treatment and rehabilitation made to healthcare providers or hospitals on behalf of the injured person. Um, those systems are very different to our social security system. In Australia, we have a single national social security system, which has total population coverage and eligibility for the many different benefits uh, that are provided or potentially provided under our social security system, are typically based on someone's income and their assets, and sometimes on their assessed work capacity or the degree of impairment in their work capacity that they're assessed as having. Uh, this is funded by general taxation revenue as opposed to employer premiums, and there are many different types of benefits. And the ones we're going to focus on in this presentation uh, the unemployment benefit, which in Australia is now known as Job Seeker. At the time this study was conducted, it was called a thing called New Start, but just think of it as an unemployment benefit. Uh, there's also a disability support pension, which is provided for to people who can demonstrate that they have a reduced capacity to work due to a permanent medical condition. Uh, and there's also the age pension, which we'll talk a little bit about today, which is for people who are have reached uh, retirement age or age pension age, uh, which in Australia at the moment is close to 66 years. Um, a, a bit of understanding of the scope of these things. In Australia, we get about 250,000 workers' compensation claims every year, about half of which uh, involve periods of time away from work. Uh, most people have very short duration claims of weeks, sometimes months. So we're gonna be talking about people who have very long duration claims lasting many years. Today, uh, in our social security system, there are at last count over a million Australians who receive either the disability support pension, which is a working age income support for people who cannot work due to a, a medical condition, or who or who receive the unemployment benefit, but who have been assessed as having a reduced work capacity. So we actually have more than a million people receiving social security benefits who have work disability, as well as the people involved in our workers' compensation scheme. So about 1.3, 1.4 million Australians at any point in time receiving benefits from one or two of, one or both of these um, two systems of social support. What we're going to be looking at today is a situation, oh, sorry, I'll come back to what we'll be looking at today. So a few statistics first. In our workers' compensation systems in Australia, um, at last count, some data released by Safe Work Australia showed that we spend nearly $6 billion on income support um, in the 2020-2021 financial year in Australia, uh, which accounted for about 55% of all of the expenditure in those systems. The next largest set of expenditure was on healthcare and, and treatment, which is about 25% of the expenditure. In most Australian workers' compensation systems, income support benefits are time limited. So the People can only receive income support for a period of two years or three years or five years. And we're going to look today at a policy change that introduced a time limit on the uh, on income support benefits. 
Um, most people who get involved in a workers' comp system in Australia have very short periods of income support of days or weeks, maybe months, and then they return to work or they leave the workers' compensation system for, for some other reason, but most people return to work. There are a small proportion of people who have very long duration claims, and we've published a couple of reports now showing that about 12% of people count for about 70% of all of the income support payments in these compensation systems in Australia, and they are the people whose claims exceed six months duration. And we know that long periods of time off work and long periods of time in workers' compensation scheme is associated with um, poor health, particularly including poor mental health, lower self-reported quality of life, financial stress due to reductions in income, changes in people's social relationships and reduced longer-term employment prospects as well. So there are many reasons why we want to understand and prevent people from being on workers' compensation schemes for long periods of time. So the question we have for this study is what happens when workers' compensation income benefits stop? Uh, and it'll become very clear why we're asking that question on my next slide. Um, but looking at that question internationally, there's actually very limited evidence available. So there are a few studies from the United States that suggests that people who have received workers' compensation income supports are more likely to apply for or to receive social security disability insurance benefits later on. Uh, and there's one study in Canada which showed that about a quarter of workers that, who were injured in 1991 and received workers' compensation claims also received a social security benefit in the five years um, following that claim, compared to about 10% of a matched community group. In Australia, we've had no studies on this. There's very limited person level data. A lot of these prior studies looking at um, aggregate information. And to our knowledge, there hasn't been any direct measurement of people's movements between workers' compensation systems and these social security systems. And most of the evidence and the data uh, from these prior studies is actually from the late 1990s. Um, even though some of these things are published in the, in the 21st century, the data is from schemes and systems that were in place last century. And most of these systems, particularly at least in Australia, have undergone quite significant reform in the last 20 years. And so our, our knowledge of the current approach is, is pretty limited. Uh, in one Australian state of New South Wales, shown here in the blue, a very significant reform to the workers' compensation scheme was introduced in 2012. New South Wales is Australia's largest state by head of population, also has the largest labour force. Um, in 2011, the state government, um, uh, in its annual review of the financial situation of the workers' compensation scheme, projected that the workers' comp scheme in New South Wales had a 4.1 billion Australian dollar unfunded liability. So essentially a very big financial black hole. Um, and in order to um, address that big financial black hole, they estimated that the premium that employers would have to pay would need to rise by 24%, which was at the time sort of unpalatable and untenable from the employer's point of view. And the government introduced a large um, reform to the workers' compensation scheme to try to constrain the costs of the scheme, and also with some efforts to improve return to work rates in the scheme. This was introduced in 2012, was called the Workers' Compensation Legislation Amendment Act. It was a very big system reform. It did many things, it tightened, but the two major things that it did was tighten eligibility. That made it harder for some groups of people to access the workers' compensation scheme. And then it also changed access to benefits for those people who did uh, manage to access the workers' compensation scheme by making them, to be frank, less generous in places and also reducing some funding for services. We previously published an overall evaluation of the impacts of this scheme in occupational environmental medicine a few years ago. Um, but this study we're talking about today, we're going to focus in on one part of that reform, which was described in what's called Section 39 of this Act of Parliament that went through the New South Wales Parliament, where in order, in one of the things that this um, reform introduced was a, a cap or a time limit on on income support in these schemes at, at a maximum of 260 weeks or five years for the majority of workers. So most people 
that were making a workers' compensation claim in New South Wales could expect to receive income support for an absolute maximum of five years, where prior to this reform, there was no maximum time limit. There were some exemptions to this, but the vast majority of workers would have been subjected to, to, this, to this, um, this reform. And it was applied prospectively, which meant that five years later, in December 2017, a group of about 4,000 workers who'd been on the New South Wales Workers' Compensation Scheme for a very long time, for at least five years, had their income support stopped. And that's the group of people we're going to follow in a data linkage study to figure out what happened to those people once their workers' compensation benefits stopped is, is this group. And so we call them the Section 39 group because they're a group of people whose benefits stopped as a result of the introduction of Section 39 of this scheme reform. Um, so here's really what happened. So prior to December 2012, when this legislative reform was introduced, people could have claims accepted. They would receive the benefits and service that, that were available prior to this reform. Um, and then once the reform was introduced, those people, um, if they had been in the system for five years or once they hit a five-year mark, they were transitioned on to what's called a transitional income support payment for a maximum of 260 weeks. And then from December 2017, their income support ceased. And so our question, the big red question mark here is what happens to those people? So they've, they've been out of work for at least five years, in some cases, 10 or 15 or longer periods of time, years or longer periods of time. Um, so they're deconditioned to work. They have long-term chronic health problems in most cases. They've been receiving income support through the workers' compensation system. And now that has been removed, where do they go for income? And where, what happens to their healthcare provision? And so here are some of the questions that we want to ask. The, big, the broad question is what happens to workers with those long duration workers' compensation claims when their workers' compensation benefits stop? And some more specific questions are things such as what proportion of these people in this group transition to the Australian social security system? So how many of them move from receiving income support in a workers' compensation system to the social security system I described earlier? And what sorts of social security benefits do those people receive? Do they receive unemployment benefits, which is a, a very low rate in Australia? Um, do they receive disability pension? Do some of them transition onto the aged pension? And what sort of benefits do they receive? We also want to try to understand what um, aspects of their personal social situations, their health, their injury are associated with transitioning onto social security benefits if they do, so that we can start to predict people who, when they move from workers' compensation, will move into our social security system. And we want to know what happens to the healthcare use because workers' compensation in Australia is a major funder of healthcare and rehabilitation and treatment for people who have work-related conditions, work-related injuries and illnesses. So when income support stops, what happens to the healthcare service use of these people as well? Do they is the, to the number of visits they have to the general practitioner change? Does their physical therapy and psychological therapy change? And who pays for that healthcare? Uh, if the workers' compensation system slowly withdraws that as, uh, as it does sometimes, um, does our um, nationally funded Medicare system pick that up? Okay, the way we chose to answer that question was through a data linkage study. Um, and Australia, unlike some of the jurisdictions in which, or the countries in which you are all from, has a relatively, um, uh, not very well established approach to data linkage. Um, we don't have a national health identifier that allows sort of automatic linkage between data sets. It's a, it's a long, uh, complex and quite drawn out process to link data, particularly between um, state government jurisdictions like our workers' compensation scheme and the national government, which looks after things like our Medicare benefits and our pharmaceutical benefits scheme. I really don't have time tonight to talk you through the two and a half years it took us to go to get approvals for and to link all of the data in this study. I'll just describe what we managed to link um, in a little bit of detail, I'll show you some results. But if you're interested in the process, you can read the protocol that we've published in those reports I mentioned earlier. At the end of the day, after a lot of work, a lot of hard work from a lot of people, we managed to link the workers' compensation data from New South Wales, obviously for the period during the person's workers' compensation claim, 
to four other major data sets, and they were what's called the Medicare Benefits Schedule, which is um, effectively a, a national um, database of healthcare service use, so healthcare service payments in Australia. Also, we looked at medicines data through a, through a thing called the Pharmaceutical Benefits Scheme. We were able to link it very importantly for this study to our social security system, which in Australia is anecdotally called Centrelink. So we have a, a, a good hit, a good record of all the Centrelink or social security payments each of these individuals in the workers' compensation data were receiving before, during, and after their claim. And we also managed to link to hospital admissions and emergency department presentations in the state of New South Wales. And for those other four data sets, we have information that precedes the person's workers' compensation claim, and really importantly, information that succeeds their workers' compensation claim. So we're able to look at these outcomes on these other systems after the person's workers' compensation benefits stop, which is obviously our main our main uh, question here. And these cases are all linked at individual case level. So we can follow individuals through all of these systems. It's an enormous complex data set we've managed to, to develop here. Now we have three groups of people in this study. Just I won't take you through the detail of this, but just quickly, we have the group of people who we're most interested in, I'm going to spend most time talking about today, the Section 39 group, and effectively two control groups. We defined a group of people we'll call the injured control group, who are also people who had an accepted workers' compensation claim in New South Wales in the same period of time as the Section 39 group. And they also had a long duration claim. They had at least two years of income support payments, but those payments stopped for some other reason. They might have gone back to work or they might have been deemed to have work capacity and had their benefits stopped, but they were not subject to this legislative reform that the Section 39 group was. And no members of our injured control group are also members of the Section 39 group. And then we have a community control group who are matched to the Section 39 group on age, sex, and the location, the geographic location in which they live in the, in the state of New South Wales. So they're our sort of community comparator as well. You'll see me talk about those three groups as we go. Uh, we have a range of different outcomes that we've defined for this study. Very briefly, they fall into these three buckets of social security payments, hospital services, and healthcare services. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about each of these, but mainly focusing on the social security payments and the healthcare services. And I will mention some of the hospital services as well. I've already talked a bit about some of the social security payments we have in Australia. Um, we'll focus on three main healthcare services, so services provided by general practitioners or family physicians, uh, physical therapy, which includes physiotherapy, uh, uh, osteopathy and um, chiropathy, and psychological therapy as well, provided by counsellors or psychologists. Um, and the way we're going to look at these outcomes is in two periods, which is the easiest way to think about this is we're going to look at the 12 months just before the person's income support stopped and the 12 months after the final workers compensation payment was made um, and so we for each person in our data set we we assign an index date which for the section 39 group and the injury control group is the date on which their income benefits stopped and we look a year before and a year after in the community control group obviously they were not in our workers compensation scheme so the index date we assigned is the 25th of december 2017, which coincides with when the Section 39 reform um, became active. And you may notice that date there, it is, yes, it is Christmas Day. It was a very unfortunate um, timing for the implementation of this Section 39 um, uh, reform, which was not planned. Okay, so some moving on to some results. Um, we received, we achieved very High linkage rates. So we managed to link 97% of the workers' compensation claims in the Section 39 group to a social security record. We managed to link um, 85 to 90 plus percent of our hospital and emergency data to the workers' compensation records and a similarly high proportion of the healthcare you know, um, data in, in our Medicare system to workers' compensation records. So we've got pretty complete um, linkage, which is fantastic. And just a note on sample size, I'm not going to 
describe the sample sizes of all of the various analysis I'll show you because they do vary a little bit depending on the outcome that we're looking at and the linkage rates in the data sets. But broadly, we're talking about pretty large groups here. We have around about 2,800 people in our section 39 group. The injured control group varies a little bit because we adjusted our exclusion criteria for this group on some of the analysis, but it's about the same size or a bit larger, up to about 3,800 people in the injured control group. And our community control group, we match people on a three to one ratio to the section 39 group. And so we've got about 10,000 people in the community control group. So there's a lot of statistical power here for us to be able to detect effect in these three groups. Okay, now the interesting stuff. So this slide is a busy slide, but I'll talk you through it. It's looking at the social security payments um, in the year before in the white bars and the year after in the black bars in those three groups of people. Section 39 group, the injured control group, and the community control group. Let's see if I can get the highlighter working here. Um, hopefully, you can see my red pointer. So, I want to focus in on this um, graph on the left here, which is uh, really just us looking at the proportion of people in each of these three groups who received any income support payment from our social security system. 12 months before and 12 months after the end of their workers' compensation benefits. And obviously it's a fairly dramatic increase from 7% of people who were receiving any income support payment from Social Security before up to 60% in the 12 months after. We also see a similar pattern, although less pronounced in the injured control group and a slight shift in the community control group. And when we look into that, it's mainly due to people moving on to the age pension. If we move over to the unemployment benefit, which, as I mentioned at the time, is called the, was called the New Start Allowance, we see, a, again, a fairly dramatic change. So um, the number of people in our Section 39 group receiving any form of unemployment benefit before their workers' compensation benefits ended was 1%, and that changed to 41% in the 12 months after. So you know, a 40 times increase, if you like. Um, we see a similar but less pronounced shift in injury control group as well. If we look at the disability support pension, the same sort of pattern emerges. A few percent of people receiving that in the 12 months prior to the conclusion of their workers' compensation benefits rising to about 20 or 19 percent in the 12 months after. Again, a sort of similar pattern, less pronounced in the injured control group. In the age pension, it appears as though a few people in each of these groups did. Um, age in, if you like, to the age pension. So they were of an age where they became eligible for the age pension when their workers' compensation benefits stopped. And so their transition was not onto unemployment benefits or disability support pension, but onto an age pension. One of the reasons you would do that in Australia is because the rate of payment for the age pension is higher, much higher than it is for unemployment benefits, for instance. And so the financial uh, income, the amount of money people receive is much higher for the age pension. It's not incredibly generous, but it is much higher than our unemployment benefit. When we um, apply a statistical analysis to these and work out the, the odds of receiving, the adjusted odds of receiving um, any, any payment in the 12 months after compared to the 12 months before, comparing the section 39 group to the community control, we see very large odds ratios. So, 25 times the odds of receiving any payment, 80 times the odds of receiving unemployment benefits, and four times the odds of receiving a disability pension. So these are large effects, and we think demonstrate that this policy change that was brought into place in the New South Wales workers' compensation system had a very substantial flow on impact and moved a lot of people across into the social security system for income support. Uh, this is another way of visualizing that data, thanks to Michael DiDonato in our section 39 group and our injured control group, really just showing you the proportion of people in the 12 months before here um, who were receiving any of these income support benefits. And you can see the largest one was disability support pension. And then what happened in the 12 months after, seeing a, a much more significant proportion of people in this, in this group up to um, close to 70%. 
receiving some form of income support payment at any point in time in that 12 months. Most of those people moved on to the unemployment benefit known as New Start Allowance. The next highest group was disability support pension, then our age pension, and then another payment which I haven't mentioned was called a carer payment. And we see a similar pattern in the injured control group, but less pronounced. So that's the main story from an income support payment point of view. Now talking a little bit about hospital service use. And Daniel, please jump in and tell me if I'm running out of time. Um, I want to make sure we have time for questions. So I might skip through um, a couple of these slides. When we look at hospital services, these are provided on a, on a state basis in Australia. So this is data from the New South Wales hospital system. And I just wanted to mention two outcomes that we looked at, which were the rate of presentations to the emergency department per 100 people in our sample and the number of hospital admissions per 100 people in our sample. And what we see generally is that people in the Section 39 group have a higher rate of emergency department presentations than people in the community, and that it doesn't really change before and after the cessation of their income support benefits. And this probably reflects the fact that they're in poorer health than people in the general community. Also, people in our winter control group have a slightly higher rate of emergency department presentations than people in the community control group. But there aren't any huge effects of pre and post uh, the reform here. If we look at hospital admissions, the same sort of pattern emerges. People in the two injured groups have a higher rate um, of admissions to hospital um, compared to our community control group. This change that we see in the injured control group after workers' compensation benefits cease is statistically significant and probably reflects that some of the reason that people benefit stop in injured control group is because they have recovered and gone back to work and so their health has returned to something a bit more like what we would see in a community control group. There's a lot more detail on hospital service use in the reports, including we looked at um, the sorts of reasons why people were admitted to hospital or presented at an emergency department and the sorts of factors that predicted whether they admitted to hospital or to an emergency department and we looked at overnight hospital stays versus day procedures and who funded hospital services i just don't have time to go into that today um, mainly because the findings don't really show a policy effect which is what we were looking for here but there's some very interesting data in that particular report so i'd refer you to that one now just quickly, I'll run through some of the results for other healthcare practitioners. So looking at general practitioner services, I'm sorry, the colours changed here. They have to adjust to that. But blue here is the pre-index period or the 12 months before income support stops and green is the 12 months after. So what we see is a very, actually a very high rate of general practitioner services per 100 people um, in our scheme. So you can see over 1,500 services per 100 people suggests a median or a mean of about 15 per person per annum, so more than one a month. It does change a little bit in the Section 39 cohort after, in the period after, and it changes more dramatically in the injury control cohort. Again, the major um, difference here is that we see a much higher rate of general practitioner services in the two injury groups compared to our community control groups. Uh, we see a similar pattern when we look at physical therapy or physical health services. So um, first thing to notice here is that the rate of services is much lower. People are seeing physical therapists much less often in this group than they are seeing general practitioners on the previous slide. There's really no change in our group of interest here, the Section 39 group before and after. There is a substantial change in our injury control group. They go from a relatively high rate to a much lower rate after their workers' compensation benefits stop, reflecting potentially changes in access to funding for those services. And we see a much lower rate of access to these services in the community. So generally people with long-term workers' compensation claims are accessing physical therapy much more than what we would see in the community. If we look at psychological therapy services, we see a very similar pattern to physical therapy, but with a lower rate again. So many fewer sorts of um, many fewer services compared to physical therapy and certainly compared to general practitioner, but the largest change is actually in our injured control group, not a lot of change in our section 39 group, and both of those groups being much higher than what we see in the community control group. 
I did have these other interesting slides to run you through. I'm just going to um, skim through those because I want to leave some time for questions. Um, but essentially, it shows that not only does the rate of services change, but the way in which those services are funded and the proportion of services that are funded for general practitioners for physical therapy and for psychological therapy changes quite dramatically as well, in that we see more of those services being funded by other forms of support other than our workers' compensation team or the injured control group, not so much in our, in our Section 39 group. Okay, so we'll draw breath there and just summarise the main findings because that's a lot of information to show in a short period of time. I'll try to bring it back to our main questions, our main reasons for running this study. So I think what we've shown here is that um, the cessation or the end of workers' compensation income support benefits for people in New South Wales who had very long-term claims when their income was stopped under the Section 39 legislative reform, that led to certain things. It led to a transition of most of those people onto the Australian social security system for their income support, most notably onto the unemployment benefit and onto the disability support pension. And we think that there's a policy effect that is pretty much a direct consequence of a change in the workers' compensation system leading to people moving onto another system of social support. We also saw a reduction in the rate of general practitioner services. And this might reflect um, a couple of things. There's a couple of possible explanations for this. One is that as people were no longer receiving income support, they were no longer required to have medical certificates pro produced by general practitioners to demonstrate that they were still work impaired. And so the, the reasons for going to the general practitioner dropped. May also re um, reflect some recovery in some people or a lack of awareness of their ongoing eligibility for those GP benefits and services. And we saw, I didn't have time to show this, but a reduction in the proportion of general practitioner services funded by workers' compensation. And again, there's probably a few possible explanations for this. We think that it's much easier to access and pay for GP services by our Medicare system in Australia, where you just swipe your card and it gets paid, um, but also potentially reflecting the reduced requirements for medical certification. There were some other really interesting findings in the study, particularly relating to this injured control group of people who had at least two years of claim duration. They also had a higher odds, a higher rate of transition to these social security payments when their income support ended, reflecting that some of those people were clearly still off work when their income support stopped in the workers' comp scheme. They had not returned to work, and so they needed some other form of income support. And it was a relatively large group of people. And we saw a very large reduction in rates of access or rates of general practitioner physical therapy and psychological therapy services in the year after income support for these people. Um, they do remain eligible technically for access or funding for those services in the workers' comp system for at least 12 months post the end of their income support, um, but don't seem to be accessing it. It might reflect that some of the people in, these, in this group have recovered or might reflect the benefits of being involved in work. Um, we also saw in workers with long duration claims in both those groups, they were more likely to be admitted to hospital and attend an emergency department than community controls, which probably reflects their generally worse state of health. So finally, the implications from this really at a high level are that these two seemingly separate systems of social protection we have in Australia are tightly connected. They're connected by the people accessing them. And when policy changes in one system, it has flow on impacts to another system. And I think this is a really clear demonstration and articulation of that. And it's, these are not small flow on impacts. These are large groups of people moving from one system to another. And you know, I think one of the implications of that is that future policy changes need to consider these impacts and the health and economic impacts of between system transitions for the for people with long duration claims. For instance, we know that moving between systems and applying for social security benefits in Australia can be very stressful. It's associated with a pretty high administrative burden and has been shown to have a health impact, particularly a mental health impact on people who are going through applications for disability support pension or unemployment benefits, for instance. And I haven't mentioned much about this, but it, this change, this transition onto our social security system also, 
probably represents a very significant drop in income for most of these people. They would have been receiving up to about 80% of their pre-work injury income in the workers' compensation scheme, dropping down to very low levels of income support through the unemployment systems and even the disability pension. Most people in Australia who are receiving these benefits are living technically living in poverty um, and also reduced access to healthcare. So that significant drop in income has big uh, a big influence on people's health as well and their ability to access healthcare. Might leave us with the strengths and limitations slides um, rather than going through it in detail. Um, and the references that I've referred to are available in the presentation. And I'll stop there and hand it back to you, Daniel, so that we have time for questions. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Alex, for an informative talk. If you could stop up, thank you. A uh, lot of information to take in there for everyone listening. Um, are there any when taking questions, if you could just let us know your name and where you're from. And um, over to you if there's any questions for Alex. Yeah, Celia, uh, Celia, you have your hand up. Go ahead. Hi, thank you, Alex. Great talk and great to see you again. Yeah, hello. Uh, hello. I was, he is. Hi. <laughs> Yeah, I was just typing you a, um, a question. Um, I was curious about the um, uh, the Section 39 group and if they had an employment, uh, did, were they employed? Did they have an employer over the years where they were on the workers' compensation? And could some of them, if yes, have um, gone back to paid work? Uh, and I'm sure you mentioned something about it, but I didn't quite get. Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Um, um, so in the state of New South Wales, um, when a person is injured, obviously, and they make a claim for workers' compensation, they have an employer. That's one of the criteria for eligibility. Mm. And the rules in the workers' compensation system in New South Wales at the time this study was conducted is that that employer has to hold that person's job open for them for six months. Um, okay. Mm. But after that point in time, they don't have to keep their job open if the person is still receiving income support benefits. In other states and territories, it's a longer duration. In, in the state of Victoria, in which I live, it's 12 months. So oh. one way to think about it is that what, certainly by the time they got to five years of income support, these people were effectively unemployed. And yeah. Yeah. very few of them would have been having any interaction with their employer at that point in time, I think. Mm. Um, certainly the goal of the workers' compensation system is to return people to employment, but it becomes mm. very complex and a big challenge when you get people with these long duration claims who still have chronic health conditions and whose employer no longer has a responsibility to keep their job open for them. Mm. Thank you. Great. A question from William Shaw. Don't know if you want to speak to that, William. Hi, Dr. Colley. Thank you for a great presentation. Um, I was um, had sort of two questions. One was uh, I was curious whether any of the workers' compensation schemes were um, helpful to try to migrate people to Social Security disability insurance, you know, knowing that they were going to lose their benefits in a certain amount of time, and you know how 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 did that work? And then. My other question is that this was obviously, a, you know, a, sort of a cost shifting effort from state level employer financed insurance to a to a tax based system at the federal level. And I'm just curious about the politics of that and how that you know, it's probably a whole nother talk. But I'm sort of curious yeah. how that how that came about and and how that sort of went went over. Thanks, Bill. And lovely to see you as well. Um... Two great questions, Bill. Um, on the first one, um, yes. There, so with this particular reform in New South Wales, um, some transitional support was provided. And so one of the things they did, and I kind of skimmed over it in my talk, is they moved all of the people that they thought were going to be impacted by this onto a transitional 
uh, income support payment for the five years, the last five years. And that, in most cases, that was actually higher than what they would have been receiving prior to this reform coming into, into play. Um, and they made efforts to um, engage with the social security system in the period leading up to these people being moved off workers' compensation to um, support their applications for social security benefits. And we do see in the data that some people actually do get access to social, some of the social security benefits that would normally take months to get through the application process. We see some people in this group getting fairly rapid access to those things. So it looks as though, um, at least in some cases, that support to transition people onto the social security system did work. Probably not for everyone, but it did work. Um, in the state of South Australia, in Australia, there was a probably an even more significant reform to the workers' compensation scheme introduced in 2015, um, where they, they introduced a very hard end to the income support at two years. So the, uh, unless there are you're sort of in exceptional circumstances, the maximum amount of time you can receive income support for in South Australia in the workers' comp scheme now is two years. And recognising that this was probably going to be a problem for some people, they set up an entire unit that is dedicated to providing people with transition support for all sorts of things, not just into social security, but for help with um, accessing financial planning or other forms of healthcare or social assistance, you know, do a whole range of things. Um, so there, that is a more recent um, 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 thing that's occurred. And I think probably as others, the general trend in Australia has been to restrict access to benefits or to time limit them. And so we're starting to see some of these other transitional arrangements or support systems sort of enacted by some of the insurers that operate the workers' comp schemes in Australia and also by regulators. So um, I wouldn't say that any unified way of doing it, but it's certainly become an issue that, that organisations have been thinking about. Um, on your second question, um, I think the New South Wales government, when they decided to do this, would have described it as a cost containment exercise, not a cost shifting exercise. But the reality is that it did move some of the costs onto the um, national social security system. You know, this three to 4,000 people we're talking about here is a drop in the bucket for our social security system. It's a small group of people in the context of the millions of people who receive social security benefits in Australia. So our national government probably wasn't even aware that this was happening, I've got to say. So that's probably the state of the politics of it is <laughs> the states do one thing and for something like this, our, our national government probably didn't even notice. I don't know if there was any interaction between them at the time, we weren't involved in that, but um, you know, at a political Thank level, you. I doubt whether it would have, would have raised too many eyebrows. We got any other questions to come in in the final few minutes? Um, hi, hi. I have one question here. I'm Dewey from Singapore, from Tan Tong Sing, Tan Tong Sing Hospital. Uh, I have a question because in Singapore, our system is very different. We only have one year of work, uh, workman's compensation of uh, for uh, people who is injured during the work, uh, from the, in the course of work. So, so it's quite a surprise to to, to know, know that um, Australia has a very good system to support the workers who are injured up to two years and even have social security system after that. Yeah, so my question is... Um, is there a difference um, in those who have who require a long term uh, compensation, who receive long term compensation, and, and those who, who are in the injured control group and those who are under Section 39? Is there an age difference or in, in terms of their injury? What type of um, differences in between these two groups, like the basic demographics or the injury and the differences? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, we, we have that data in the reports that I mentioned. Um, there are some differences. Um, both groups are groups of people who um, have long-term chronic health conditions. Most of them, the reason for making a worker's compensation claim was some form of musculoskeletal disorder. Um, so they're, and correct me if I'm wrong, Daniel, they're predominantly male, a majority male. Um, 
you know, predominantly sort of middle-aged and aging as they stay on the workers' compensation system for long, longer periods of time. Um, and one of the things we've, we've benefited from in being able to link to the social security data is to get a much clearer sense of things like their family status, their housing and living arrangements, um, which that, which that sort of data, which isn't actually available in our workers' compensation scheme. So um, that information is in the reports as well. Um, but they, ref I mean, people who are on workers' compensation benefits in Australia for long periods of time are a bit different from people who have an injury, make a claim, return to work. You know, they tend to have um, yeah, a whole vast range of different, you know, we, we kind of all are probably mostly familiar with the sorts of factors that predict long durations of work disability, um, you know, across people's social and employment and personal sort of circumstances. And a lot of these people exhibit some of those features, I would say. Um, they, the longer they stay on the workers' compensation scheme, the more likely they are to develop other conditions, and particularly we've noted sort of psychosocial and mental health conditions in these groups of people in some of the analysis that we've we've looked at. Um, so they, they are quite different to people who have short shorter durations of period of time on our workers' comp schemes. I hope that's answering your question. Yes, thank you. Anyone want to get final a final question. question in before we wrap up? Uh, Barry's raised a good one on the chat. Um, so I might address that. So um, that's a good point. Barry, so Barry lives in Victoria, I think, and has been a um, long-term analyst and observer of our RHS and workers' comp schemes here. And in the state of Victoria at the moment, we have uh, our workers' compensation system is in a pretty dire financial state, a bit like what New South Wales was in back in 2011 when the government made a decision to reform the New South Wales system, as I described. It appears as though, if you believe the reports in the newspapers here, that the Victorian government is about to go through a process of restricting access to our workers' compensation scheme to reduce expenditure and also potentially um, reducing the generosity of some of the benefits that the scheme provides. So it's going to do effectively a very similar thing to what New South Wales did more than 10 years ago. Um, and mainly it appears as though it's going to be focused on mental health condition claims, which are the sorts of conditions that we typically see that last for a very long period of time in our workers' comp systems and become very costly um, for the insurers. So it appears as though in the state of Victoria, the eligibility for a, a work-related mental health condition is going to become much harder to demonstrate and it might be restricted just to people with post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, we don't sort of know the details, but that's what's being reported at the moment. Um, and that will that will mean those people who would previously have been able to access the workers' compensation system will no longer be able to access that system and will require benefits and services funded by some other part of society, either by themselves or by the social security system or by some other some other funding mechanism in in a, in in this state or nationally. And you know, what this is not uncommon in Australian workers' comp systems. I'm not sure how common this sort of reform is in other countries. Um, but here we see this sort of thing all the time. The schemes get um, the boundaries of the schemes get manipulated based on the the financial viability of the system. So they get tightened when things are going poor, poorly financially, and they get expanded when things are going well. Um, it makes for a great natural experiment. If you're interested in um, evaluating and understanding policy changes, but it, it's, it's tough on some people um, who find themselves no longer able to access these sorts of benefits. Thank you, Alex. I'd just like to wrap up by saying thank you again, everyone, for attending. And thank you, for Alex, for today's presentation. So we're hoping to do these sorts of events every two months or so. We're putting a call out for speakers. We have a few spaces. So 
please email me if you're interested in um, taking part in a future presentation. And uh, I encourage you to sign up to the WDPI.net newsletter as well for further information about um, work from the scientific committee. Um, thank you again, and we'll make the recording available also on that web page. Uh, thank you, and good night or good morning, depending on where you are. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Lovely to see you all.